Hey, thanks for checking out this sermon. Our team worked hard to put this sermon together with you in mind, and we hope it helps you take your next step with Jesus. Enjoy. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? I don't, all I know is I heard churros, tacos, and a mini horse. And I'm interpreting mini horse as little Sebastian is out there, okay? So any of you Park and Rec fans know what I'm talking about. So we have little Sebastian here today. That's my kind of church. Uh, I, I'm so glad that you were here. I hope this is your kind of church. My name is Billy, and today we begin a six-week message series that is 100% focused on our very favorite person, in the entire universe, Jesus. We're gonna talk about his life, his character, his work, his message, his gospel, his relationships, his words, his actions, his personhood, and his godhood. Jesus is our focus for the next month and a half. I hope you're excited about this because I am absolutely thrilled to just do a deep dive and study our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, the risen one, Jesus Christ. For Christians, the centrality of Jesus can be tied to every single book of the Bible, cover to cover. Who has a Bible? Anybody have a Bible? I usually have a Bible in here. Can I borrow a Bible? Oh, thank you, David. Oh, and thank you, madam. I have two Bibles now. I had none. Now I have two. I'm abundant. I'm in an abundance. This Bible, everywhere you turn, guys, it's focused it's pointing to Jesus Christ. It refers to Jesus in every single book, 39 and 27, Old Testament and New Testament, all pointing to, alluding to, prophesying about, mentioning Jesus, every single book. So for example, if you turn to uh, the book of Genesis, you're gonna see that the Lord created the universe in Genesis chapters one, two, and three. But we learn though, don't we, that the universe was created for Jesus, in Jesus, and through Jesus. That's the start. Well, if you flip to the back. Actually, David, it looks like this is brand new. Have you not been reading your Bible, buddy? <laughs> oh, it's an old Bible. Doesn't look like it's been read. <laughs> well, that's another sermon. Um, Re <laughs> Revelation, right? Revelation, the end of the Bible, we see Jesus unveiling all of the mysteries of God. And we also see every, every single man and woman bowing their knee at the judgment seat of Christ. We also see Jesus leading the charge in heaven of bringing about the Father's purposes in the new creation for all of eternity. Jesus, every single book, he's in here, every letter, every epistle, every prophecy. Thank you guys, here, you can have these back because you may need them later, and you're definitely gonna need yours, bud. <laughs> the centerpiece of all Christian thought and and theology is guess who? Jesus, yes. Every time I say the word theology, there is a certain portion of the audience that starts to break out into a cold sweat because theology is like, oh, it's like calculus. It's like chemistry, right? It's this topic that invokes fear and dread. But if theology were a maze, and sometimes it is a maze, isn't it? At every turn, at every corner, there's no dead ends because there you find Jesus. In fact, there is an entire branch of theology called Christology, Christology, that's uh, totally focused to studying the work and the purposes of Jesus. In fact, I hope that maybe some of you will be inspired by this series to engage in theological study. Maybe some of you will even go on to do this professionally, be a professional Christologist, because we need people who are passionate about Christ, who are enamored with him, having the theological conversations at the academic high tower levels so that we can continue to venerate Jesus. We talk a lot about Jesus in church, don't we? But it's not just in church that Jesus is talked about. It turns out he's a pretty popular guy out on the street, outside the four walls of the church. 
Time Magazine recently conducted an algorithm-driven analysis. Okay, not a survey, but like nerd stuff that analyzes all the available content in the whole world. And it revealed that the top 10 most written about most important figures in human history. Let me just show you the list. Here's the top 10 list. Interesting list, huh? (laughs) Interesting list. So according to time, who's more popular, Jesus or Kanye? (laughs) Well, thank goodness it's Jesus. In fact, I would submit to you humbly that Jesus loves Kanye more than Kanye loves Kanye. Amen. Jesus is simply the most written about person. He's the most talked about, most debated over human being who has ever lived or who ever will live. Movies, books, blogs, Broadway musicals. Uh, I mean, every type of satire, comic books, academic papers, encyclopedia sets have all been written and created this sea of content that exists, all offering a different opinion, a different take on who Jesus is and what he accomplished. It can be pretty overwhelming who agrees with that. Yes, it can. But thankfully today and for the next six weeks, our strategy isn't going to be trying to kind of coalesce all this information. We're going to be more laser focused than that. What we're going to do is look at our study through the eyes of one of the gospel writers. His name is Dr. Luke. And he was inspired by the Holy Spirit and he gives us a detailed and a historical account of the life of Christ. He actually pens the longest gospel. But don't let that freak you out. We're just going to drop in to certain passages his, his gospel was so long, it actually needed to have a sequel. The book of Acts is the continuation of, of the, the gospel of Luke. And in these pages, he tells us who Jesus is and what he did and why he came. And he doesn't just give us information to make us smarter about Jesus. He gives us the life of Christ and challenges us to respond in a real way at every single page and paragraph. And that, friends, is what we are going to do. We are going to learn, we are going to understand, and we are going to respond. Does that sound like a good plan, everybody? Thank you for the four people who said yes. For the rest of you, I'll just take it that you're really thinking about what I've said. Let's then go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter five. And just to give you kind of a heads up of where we're headed in today's content, here's the the sort of overall broad brush focus is Jesus is, what is he doing? He's calling us to follow him. He's calling us to follow him. It turns out that Luke recounts several instances of calling passages or calling scenes. And we see Jesus inviting people to follow him. It's something that the Lord does many, many times in the gospel accounts. And it turns out he's still doing this. He's still inviting people to follow him. So let's read this first text and then we're going to pull some application out. Okay, verse 1. We'll go through, I think, verse 11. Here it says, Luke says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of of Gennesaret, that is the Sea of Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. Now here's Simon, guys, is Peter, all right? The soon-to-be apostle Peter is, is named Simon here. And Jesus asks him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down in the boat and taught the people from the boat. Verse four, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, master, master, listen, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came. And then they filled both boats so that they both began to sink. They were so full. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were just astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners, Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. And so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. Beautiful passage, is this not? It's a very familiar passage with so many of us who are are students of our Bibles. 
But in this first call scene, Jesus, he's beginning to form together his initial band of followers. And they come from all walks of life. Here we see fishermen, there's, there's tax collectors, there's tradespeople, there's workers, everyday people, right? Parents and, and just regular folks. And Peter and Andrew were part of this regular folk category of followers. But they were out fishing all night, the text says. And they hadn't caught a thing. And these guys were commercial fishermen. They're not recreationally fishing. This is how they make their living. And so they extended a ton of labor, a ton of effort, a ton of capital, in a sense, was, ex- was put forward that evening. And there was zero to show for it. That was a tough night. Because no money was coming in that day. And they had families to feed. And then they had a business to maintain. Now, it doesn't say this, but I just kind of put myself in their position in this scene. And I think, I bet they were tired. They had been working all night, and so this was the end of the shift, and they were probably hungry, and they were probably not in a good mood. I wouldn't have been in a good mood. I would have been in a bad mood. And there they are, washing their nets in a bad mood, tired and hungry, and a meeting breaks out, a big meeting where this guy named Jesus is teaching on the, on the shore. It's very unusual. And so the crowds, it says, they're pressing in, and so the Lord says, hey, Pete, can I borrow your boat and let, just push out? And I can just see Peter getting in the boat and saying, okay, and he's kind of trying to keep it towards shore and facing Jesus towards the shore for the crowds to hear him. And after this, Jesus turns to Peter and says, hey, let's go head out into the deeper water. Let's go fishing. Okay, so here's the problem, is that this was the middle of the day. And the daytime is when commercial fishermen slept because fish on the Galilee were caught at night. Not during the day. They were caught at night. And everybody, everybody knew this fact. The Galilee was a series of communities along this lake, along this sea. And it just revolved around the fishing industry. And so everybody knew that you don't go out and send the fishermen during the day. And then furthermore... There's Jesus, a carpenter. He's not a fisherman. He's a carpenter by trade, telling Peter's sons out. Perfect time to fish. Let's go. This is this important moment in Peter's life. It's it's right here in the timeline that this crisis of will happens. You can almost kind of feel it in the story. And that... Peter's life would be changed. It's like a fork in the road. Jesus says, let's go. And circumstantially, Peter had every reason to say like, ah, yeah, not really though, right, Jesus? Because you know, we don't really catch fish in the daytime. Professionally speaking, me being the professional, me being the one who's devoted my whole life to this trade, and then you (laughs) being a carpenter and everything. So he had every reason to say no. And yet, what does he say? What does he say? This beautiful phrase, because you say so, I will let down the nets. This is the pivotal moment. This is the fulcrum, the watershed. The fish aren't biting anyway, even when we're supposed to catch them. It's daytime. I'm tired. I'm hungry. Actually, I just prepped the nets for the next shift tonight, and they're all laid out, and they're ready to go, and you're going to want to mess this up. You're going to want to mess this up, Jesus. Nevertheless, because you say so, let's go. Because you say so. I think so many times the followers of Jesus have their because you say so moments, don't they? Have you had your because you say so moment with Jesus? A because you say so moment with Jesus is when you have every reason to believe that this course of action that he's calling you to is really stupid. It just cuts against the grain of logic and rational thought and everything that you know in your experience as a finite, pea-brained human being, and yet you have a take on it, and you're like, no, I don't think that's the way to go. But because you say so, it's a fulcrum, it's a moment, it's a fork in the road. And this was Peter's moment. I think we tend to focus on Peter's weaknesses a lot, don't we, when we look at his life? He's kind of a popular guy to talk about when we do sermons and studies because he has these very public flameouts elsewhere in scripture. He's very impetuous. He's kind of overestimating himself all the time. He's kind of a big talker. And I I think we like to focus on that because we relate to those things. And also there's a side of us that's like, yeah, we like to see people flame out kind of, don't we? Were you just paying attention right there? Because if you were, you'd be nodding. You're like, yeah, we kind of like that. 
Peter shows us, though, here a quality that is very, very critical for every single person to have who follows Jesus. He shows us this thing called humility. This is what it takes to follow Christ. Humility. He responds humbly to Jesus' request. Humility. Follow me, Jesus calls. Peter shows humility and follows him. Jesus looks at Peter and says, follow me. He says effectively also, but you can't follow me with your nets full. Your nets have to be empty. Peter's nets were empty. Let's talk about empty nets for a second. This is what, what did Peter have when he started following Jesus? What did he have? This is not a trick question. He, he had nothing, okay? <laughs> he had zero. He had an empty net of nothingness. And it wasn't for lack of effort, right? He, on the contrary, Peter worked very hard. He was not a slacker. He was a hard worker. He was out there grinding it out. He was exhausted. He was working to support his family. He was working to make a living. Uh, he was working to gain some significance. He was wanting to have a little bit of stature, I would suppose, in his community. And so he's carving out something very difficult to carve out, which is not only a beyond subsistence living in the first century uh, of Palestine, but he's trying to get ahead in the community just as any person would in his situation, and yet with all that effort, with all that striving, with all that labor, he found himself on a beach next to a huge meeting that just happened to break out with a bunch of nothing, with a big, fat, empty net. And Jesus looks over at this whole thing, and he says, ah, empty net, perfect. You're the perfect person that I would like to have follow me. Jesus doesn't call those whose nets are full so that he can empty those nets. Rather, he calls those whose nets are empty so that he can later fill them. That's how he operates, friends. Can you imagine trying to follow Jesus wherever he's gonna take you? Dragging along a net full of your awesomeness. It just weighs you down. It'd probably sink that boat, wouldn't it? Peter had to admit something. I call it ENS, empty net syndrome. This is a true medical term I've just made up this week. <laughs> empty net syndrome. This is where you admit that you have nothing. And so therefore, Peter was humble. And Jesus is like, yeah, 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 I can work with humble. I can work with empty. Actually, I prefer it. I like empty. I like, I like humble. And so, friends, we should take notice of Peter here. Because maybe you found your way to Cornerstone and you're in the situation where you've given life your best shot. You're trying to fill your net. You're trying to fill your net, pulling an all-nighter, so to speak, working real hard, finding that fulfillment, chasing that success, trying to get that peace in your life. Maybe there's some relational discord that you just can't seem to get over the top of. And like Peter, the chase has left you feeling empty, tired, and frustrated. And that's how you've come to church today. You're wondering what it takes to get ahead in this difficult 21st century Bay Area life. And maybe you've even done everything right, right? According to all the common knowledge and understanding that we have access to, which is quite a bit, maybe you've read the leadership books, you've, you've sought after career advice, and so you've really tried to have that, that sensible career trajectory. Maybe you even consulted relationship experts to try to figure out why your relationships seem to be circling the toilet so much. And yet, with all of this effort, with all of this striving and this labor, you're still feeling empty. Welcome to the club. A big, huge church is filled with people who've been in that place and maybe some what still are. And so welcome, friend, because you are perfect. You're a perfect person to follow Jesus because spiritually speaking, you're exactly the kind of individual that would be an excellent follower of Christ. If that's where you are today, then answer the call. Answer the call. He's calling. Follow me. You with an empty net. You who've tried so hard. Follow me, answer that call today. It doesn't say this, but perhaps Peter was looking down at these empty nets as Christ was talking to him and thought, well, I've tried everything else. Why not push the boat out into the deep water and follow the rabbi's command? What have I got to lose? So 
how does this apply for you? Well, go ahead, push your boat out into the deep water and follow the Lord's calling for your life because what have you got to lose? He's calling. He's calling. Will you answer the call? Will you follow him? Hmm. Let's go to another call scene. There's another one here in this chapter, verse 27. Interesting um, situation that we're about to read, very similar but also very different. Let's go ahead and read verse 27. After these things, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Okay, uh, Levi, friends, Levi is Matthew. Levi is Matthew. Everybody has two names, it seems like. Uh, And so here we have that. So Levi, follow me, Jesus said to Levi. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered, well, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so here we see Levi received his call to follow Jesus. In Peter's case, the calling of the Lord came at a time when he was having a bad day, when his nets were empty, right? He was at a low point, professionally, if you will. But Matthew was the opposite. Matt had more money than he knew what to do with. Matt was a tax collector. And as as a tax collector, he was well paid by the Romans to do this job. And on top of that, we know from our history books that many tax collectors were notorious for what? For stealing, for overcharging people of what their real tax bill was, and then they would pocket the delta, the difference. So Matt was loaded. Matt was loaded. He, had, he, he, he could not, he had Amazon Prime and he had boxes coming every day. I mean, even the drones were flying over his place. And every day they were dropping stuff. He just couldn't spend it fast enough. And it's like, you see this, he held a great banquet, a big party he held because he had the cash to do it. But here's the thing. Even though Matt's tax booth was filled with coins, I bet it was just as empty as those nets. Because wealth, and then especially when you don't get it right, that thing is an empty bucket. It promises to fulfill you and it doesn't. And so Matthew was just as empty. And Jesus knew this because he saw through the facade and he said, follow me. Jesus shows up. They both left everything. Peter and Matthew. I want to take a look at what happens right after Jesus brings Matt on the team. Because at this party, it was a big party. Do you guys like parties? I love parties. My name is Billy. I like to party. <laughs> anybody seen Hot Rod? Anybody seen, anybody seen Hot Rod? Yeah, that's an obscure movie. So there you go. That one's for you. You got it. All right. So what do we have? In, we have a Kanye reference, we have a Park and Rex reference, and now we have a Hot Rod reference. So you never know what pop culture is going to you know, manifest itself. You know, let's just keep going, all right? That's the best way to go here. <laughs> the Pharisees and Jewish scribes crash this party, and they don't just kind of go to get some food and stuff. They're going on the warpath because they begin to immediately to point their fingers at the disciples. They're reprimanding these brand new followers. And so they sort of level this accusation and Jesus responds and then they do it again. Let's read their second attack in verse 33. They said to him, the Pharisees, John's disciples often fast and pray and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours, Jesus, go on eating and drinking. Jesus, your disciples are always feasting when they should be fasting. We've noticed this, and we're going to point out this to you because it's wrong and it needs to stop. Your disciples need to be more like us Pharisees who really know holiness. We know how to get to the Lord's, like, included into the Lord's, like, what he's doing, and your guys don't. They miss it. And furthermore, there's a comparison thing. They don't even like John's disciples, And they're like, hey, and furthermore, John's disciples says, why can't your guys be more like his guys? More like us. So that's the accusation. This is crazy to me because the disciples hadn't even done any ministry yet, had they? 
what is there to judge? They haven't even done anything yet. Some of them at this party are literally meeting each other for the first time. This is Matt's party, brand new little band of followers. They're not even all complete yet. And Peter's like, hi, I'm coming into the party, I would imagine. My name's Pete, everybody. Uh, I'm a fisherman. I'm married. I just caught this big load of fish. Let me tell you about it. It's a great party story. And then Matt's turn. He's like, well, nice to meet you, Pete. My name is Matt. So, hey, listen, full disclosure moment. I, to- I collect taxes for the Romans. So, you know, you can feel the tension in the room. But I just quit my job. I just quit my job. So there's that. And Peter's like, hey, I just quit my job too. So there's a lot of unity here. So they're just meeting each other. And yet the Pharisees seem like they have a lot of ammo to to fire. The fact is the disciples weren't obeying the Pharisees fasting regulations. They had a lot of regulations. It says later in, in the book of Luke, that the Pharisees and many other Jews fasted two times a week, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., like clockwork. Two times a week, boom, they're fasting. And when they fasted, guys, everybody knew about it. Because they'd walk around the, the town, the streets, and they would put on these long faces, this like fasting face, and they would mess up their hair, you know, like this, And they would just walk around super Eeyore, super forlorn. Oh, I'm fasting today, everyone. I'm so hungry. I'm suffering. I'm suffering for you, God. And they would do this. And they made sure that everybody saw it. And then on the, sometimes they'd put on their weekend grubby clothes, their yard work clothes, and tatter them up to to add to the drama. And they just kind of, and, and it was this big show. And most of it, I'm sure there were some people that were genuine, but a lot of it wasn't, it was disingenuous. It was meant to kind of um, aggrandize. It was meant to just kind of get people to look at their piety and their devotion to the Lord. It wasn't authentic worship. If you look into the Jewish codes, not the Bible, but the Jewish codes of law at the time, on some of the more intense fasting days, you weren't even allowed to swallow your own saliva. Come on, man, how do you even do that? (laughs) That's where they took it. So the kicker is that none of this is actually in the, how's my hair, I messed my hair up. I've had the same haircut since eighth grade, so it just usually naturally follows, just flops back. There's none of this in the Bible anywhere. There's only one Old Testament command to fast in Leviticus 16.29, it says, on the 10th day of the seventh month, that is Yom Kippur. Just one day a year, the Israelites were commanded to fast by Yahweh. All the other fasting that you see in the Old Testament is optional fasting. It's a voluntary spiritual discipline to help a person just remove some of the momentary distractions of their day to get closer to God, to get to hear maybe his voice of direction or to to obtain some kind of spiritual breakthrough that they needed. And so getting rid of food for a short period is, is, was a way to do that, accomplish that. And I think that's smart because, man, I, when I've had a big meal or I've eaten really well, you know, uh, on a day or so. I mean, I, I'm not thinking about the Lord at all. I'm just like super fat and happy and I don't want to hear his voice. I just want to go on the couch and chill. And I mean, it's, it's kind of true even today. And so fasting is a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to help us hear God and to just kind of cut through the noise of life. But the Pharisees took this beautiful concept of voluntary fasting and they turned it into an obligatory, you must do this twice a week exercise. And this is actually what religion tends to do with everything spiritually that is beautiful, is to turn it into mandatory activity and murder it. And so this was happening. Now, it doesn't say this in our passage, but I wonder if Matt's party was going on at the same time as one of these twice-a-week fasts, and the Pharisees were walking around, oh, I'm so fast, and then they come across this party, and they're just like, wait a second, and they crash, and that could explain why they were lobbing these grenades. Here's what happens next. Look at this. I love this. Verse 34, Jesus answered, 
can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and in those days they will fast. This, there's, there's a lot. Of, this is very deep. But first, let me just point out, who answered? Who answered the accusation? Jesus did. The disciples don't say anything in this interchange because Christ immediately steps in and he defends his people. Jesus is the one who resists the accusations. Jesus is the one who vindicates when people start criticizing. He sticks up for people. He sticks up for his people. He's the spokesperson. That's Jesus. He's our leader. He sticks up for us. He's not stopped doing this. Let me say something important about following Christ at this point, because especially if you're considering whether or not you want to do this thing called have faith in Jesus, I want to tell you something that maybe you won't hear from other people, just because it may seem like I'm trying to talk you out of it. But we got to be honest about what it means to be a Christian. Once you start following Jesus, eventually you will get criticism. Uh, it's not just Peter and Matthew and first century biblical stuff here. This happens to all of us. Once people around you figure out that you have declared faith and that you're actually living out this thing called your Christianity in your life, you're going to get criticized for it. You just are. You're going to take hits for it. You might be made fun of by people who think you're now an idiot and you're believing in this fairy tale. You might be accused of being a hypocrite because you say one thing and then they see you, you know, doing something else. Or maybe there's actually other Christians who just don't like how you're living out your Christianity because you're doing it wrong. You're doing your Christianity wrong and you're gonna take hits from friendly fire and you're gonna be like, they're gonna say things like, why do you have drums when you worship? That shouldn't be the case, you're doing it wrong. Or why do you do this? Or why do you believe this sort of side thing in theology? You're doing it wrong. And sometimes that feedback is warranted and other times it's not. But let me just tell you, in case I didn't get this point across, following Jesus is going to bring slide criticism from others. It just is. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's close the meeting out right now. Let's pray. That was supposed to be funny. All right. It didn't work. <laughs> well, somebody may say, well, Billy, I've never been criticized for being a Christian. I've been a Christian for 20 years. I've never had any of this. And that very well may be true, friend, because A, your faith is so privatized that nobody knows about it. Or B, you only hang around other Christians and so it's a very closed social group. Or C, the criticism is behind your back and you just don't know about it. <laughs> a lot of it happens on social media. There's a lot of trolls behind their keyboards feeling pretty brave, trying to make fun of, of folks who have faith. Actually, studies have shown that religion is one of the main triggers of negative emotional interactions online. So even if criticism doesn't hit you in the face, you're certainly able to find it on Facebook. So here's the teaching. When the criticism comes your way, as you follow Christ, you don't have to retaliate. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to get insecure and try to you know, become the voice of apologetics for America. Why? Because Jesus wants to fight that battle for you. That's what he does. And so my advice to you, friends, is let Christ defend you. Let Jesus defend you. He's much better at answering people's criticisms who are constantly looking at your life, trying to pick it apart for what you're doing wrong. Let him fight those battles. Let the Lord defend you. Let the Lord come to your aid because he's way smarter than you or me at doing this. Here's how the Lord did it that day. We'll put the verse back up. You'll notice that Jesus immediately makes a wedding analogy. Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? And so Jesus uses a wedding metaphor to describe his relationship with his followers. He's saying that he's like a groom and his followers are like a wedding party and this is a wedding party situation. It's very, very good. Do you know the one provision in the Jewish codes that exempted a person in Judaism from fasting? There was one place in the Jewish codes where you didn't have to fast if a fast was called for. Can you guess where it was? It was at a wedding. 
a wedding. So when a wedding was called in the community and everybody showed up, everybody loved to go because it was an awesome party. We liked to party as well. But also you didn't have to fast. Those fasts were canceled and even the Pharisees would cancel their fasts. And a Jewish wedding feast was awesome because they could last up to seven days. And so Jesus uses their own rule book at them to defend his followers. And if you notice, there was absolutely zero rebuttal. The controversy ended right then and there because Jesus is our master defense attorney and our job <laughs> is to let him, let him do his job so that we don't have to do his job. It may feel like the path of least resistance because some of us do have some fight still left in us and we do want to defend but thankfully, feeling isn't always fact. Some people may say, well, Jesus was physically there to defend his disciples, but Billy, he's not physically there to defend me at my job or in my family or at Thanksgiving. How does this work then? Excellent question, and I'll let the next pastor at the next sermon answer that. <laughs> Final thought, very difficult, very tricky, but here's just a couple of things. When the criticism comes as you follow Christ, pause. Don't react. Pray. Pause. Pray. Don't react immediately. Be slow to speak. And be humble. And pray this prayer or something like it. Lord, I'm going to put this in your hands. And then you watch him work. That's a good starting spot. Well, our time is up, friends. I want to just give you one more slide. This is what we covered today. Jesus is calling the empty and defending the called. That's our Lord. That's what he's doing. And that's what he's doing then, and it's what he's doing now. So let's close in prayer, shall we? Please bow your heads with me. Well, Lord, we thank you so much that we have this opportunity to spend a month and a half just focusing on you and your life and your work in our lives. And I pray that this process would be a positive one for so many of us, especially those who maybe have already been following you but have been drifting. And uh, maybe this follow me message is, is not a message of initially following you, but maybe it's to come back to following you. And so we pray for those who are in that space here at Cornerstone that you would help us have the courage to, to, to leave whatever net we were trying to fill up on our own and then begin to follow you again. Give us that, Lord, that faith. Others of us are here that need to hear this for the first time. And I pray, God, that you would give us the courage and the faith to leave everything behind and start following you unashamedly, Lord. We all have our because you say so moments, Lord. And so if we're wrestling through that today, I also pray you would give us the courage and the faith to bow our knee to you, just like Peter did in that boat. And Lord, for those of us who are being attacked and who are feeling vulnerable, like what it means to be a Christian in a world that is very antithetical to the things of Christ, I ask you to help us take a step back and let you defend us. Lord, you are a master. You not only call us, and then walk away. No, no, you don't do that, Lord. You call us and then you walk with us our entire lives. And so, Lord, it is a privilege and an, on, and an honor to answer that call. And I pray that we would, all of us, do that in some degree, in some form, or in some fashion here today. Lord, we love you and we thank you for who you are. And it is in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless.